In the new game Scarlet and Violet, it has been revealed that the Pokemon that you have had in previous generations will be allowed to transfer up into the new games once home compatibility is uh, finished next year. However, the moves that those Pokemon have currently on them will not be allowed to be transferred into the new games. So if your Pokemon know certain moves right now in Sword and Shield, you can transfer them to home and they will keep those moves. But if you want to move those Pokemon into Scarlet and Violet, they will no longer know any of the moves that they knew previously. They will instead learn moves that they would have at that level if they were caught in the wild. And this is similar to how it was in Sword and Shield if you wanted to use their Pokemon in online competitions. If you talk to the man in the battle tower, then he would get your Pokemon competition ready, but that involved losing all of the moves that you previously had learned. So this is something that now they are making you do as standard. And while previously you could still battle your friends without having competitive ready Pokemon, uh, with, with specifically that competitive mark that was only gotten by getting rid of moves. Now that's no longer an option. Now all Pokemon that are imported into Scarlet and Violet must have gotten rid of all of their moves previously. So this is a very big deal for competitive Pokemon. Because this means that moves are now limited to whatever the game lets you have. Previous In previous games, Pokemon have had access to event exclusive moves and have had access to uh, uh, previous generation moves. A lot of times this involves things from XD Gale of Darkness or from Gen 4 TMs uh, or move tutors from Platinum specifically. And then of course there's the infamous Wish Chansey or Refresh Salamence, right? This manner of thing. Uh, if you get to Ubers, you got things like Rayquaza having V Create, right? Or any Victini with V-Create, right? All of those are event moves only. And you can only uh, get those in current games if you had it previously. So, in Scarlet and Violet, you won't have the option of bringing those up and retaining those moves. So, if you want to keep those event-specific Pokemon, if you have any of those, I would highly recommend not bringing them into Scarlet and Violet. I would leave them in Pokemon Home and only deal with Pokemon from Pokemon Scarlet and Violet in this game. Because as soon as you bring in any other Pokemon, then it's going to immediately lose all of its other moves. Now, if you don't care about the moves and you just want to bring in your cool shinies that you got in previous games, I don't think that's a big deal. I think that'll be just fine. And especially if it's Pokemon from uh, Legends of Arceus, where those moves always get lost no matter where you take them to, I think that also is totally acceptable. But if it's from a game uh, with an event exclusive move, I really strongly suggest you don't bring it into Scarlet and Violet. In any case, today I want to talk about 10 moves that are used in competitive Pokemon that have a unique niche in the metagame that are going to be much more limited as a result of not allowing transfer moves to be brought into the game. So to get us off started, I'm going to start off with number 10, which is Flip Turn. Flip Turn is a move that was introduced in the Isle of Armor DLC in Sword and Shield, and it was already not well distributed, but many of the Isle of Armor moves had sort of weird distribution. So Flip Turn is actually one of the very few Isle of Armor moves that actually made it into Scarlet and Violet at all. Uh, moves such as Poltergeist and Lash Out, things like that, they don't exist as such in Scarlet and Violet. At least no Pokemon learns those moves. But Flip Turn is learned by two Pokemon. It's learned by Palafin, and it's learned by Iron Bundle. Iron Bundle is, of course, a future Dullybird, in case you're not used to these new names. But uh, Flip Turn is only learned by those two Pokemon. So, of course, there's U-Turn on many Pokemon, and there's Volt Switch on many Pokemon. But Flip Turn for water types is only learned on Palafin and Iron Bundle. So if you want to use that move, you're going to be limited to those two options. Next up, we've got an even more restricted move. And this one is a shocker to many in the community right now. Scald is only learnable by Volcanion. That's it. 
Volcanium will never run Scald because it has Steam Eruption, which is a powered up version of Scald. Scald has previously been one of, if not the best move in all of Pokemon. It punishes physical attackers. It can prevent you from, uh, it can prevent your opponent from sweeping you by setting up in front of a more passive water type. And it really brings down the power level of the physical attackers in the tier. But because Scald is only learned by Volcanion, this means that physical attackers will be able to run rampant. Now there are still a certain Intimidate Pokemon, specifically Landris is among them, and, and I know at least one dog Pokemon gets Intimidate. So you do have that option left for physical attackers, but aside from Intimidate and Will-O-Wisp, you don't really have too many good options for pu punishing physical attackers now in Pokemon. Uh, so Scald being gone is really huge. There is Lava Plume that does still exist, but Lava Plume was already a pretty restricted move on many fire types. So I, we may see a, a rise in bulky fire types. But the bulky water type has been a, a, a an archetype that has existed for many, many generations now. And Scald was something that really let it thrive in Generation 5 and beyond. But now that Scald is no longer here, that's going to radically shape how the metagame forms moving forward. Uh, among other factors. It won't be the only big factor that shapes the metagame, but do, do watch out for this one. This is a very huge one. Alright, next up we're going to talk about Roost. Now, as you can see, Roost is actually distributed on a fair number of Pokemon, so it's not necessarily the most restricted move, not like the previous ones we've seen, but consider that this is the entire list of Pokemon that currently are allowed to run Roost. Now, in previous games, it's mostly been restricted to flying types, but even Pokemon like Tapu Koko would have Roost. So, this is uh, this list is here more for your own perusal, right? Look at this list. You can see which moves, uh, which Pokemon have Roost. If there's a Pokemon that's going to be in Scarlet and Violet and is not on this list, then it's not going to have Roost, which may uh, may be important for a few Pokemon, right? So you just have to figure out which Pokemon on this list uh, don't, don't get Roost. Next up, in a similar category, we have Wish. Wish actually is a little more important than Roost because Roost does affect the Pokemon that's using it. But Wish not only can affect the Pokemon that's using it, but also it can affect uh, the, the teammates of the Pokemon. So Wish passing is very useful tool for a team to have. Now there are a few common wish passers that retain their ability to do so. Chief among them uh, Umbreon and Vaporeon for the evolutions and Alomomola is back with wish pass. But if we look at many of the other Pokemon on this list, they're either unproven or they are Pokemon that don't necessarily usually wish pass. For example, Gardevoir usually is more of a an attacking Pokemon and less of a support Pokemon outside of uh, outside of draft formats. Uh, in draft, you can run a bulky Wish Gardevoir, but usually you're running a special attacking offensive Gardevoir. So that's not going to usually be running Wish. Love Disk, even if it were to run Wish, isn't going to be an effective Wish passer because that doesn't have much HP. I feel like that in a similar vein, we may see a uh, a Raichu in that category. Now Delphox and uh, and I've even seen bulky breaks in at times run Wish, but uh, Delphox usually wants to be a a, a special attacker as well. Uh, Forges is going to be a good one. Kamala sometimes runs Wish as well if it has to. So you do have a couple options there, but aside from the evolutions and then Lomomola, which is always on Wish duty and Florges, you don't really have that great of wish options. So if you want to have a wish passer on your team, these are your options. So I would expect to see a lot more Umbreon users, personally. Uh, next up, we've got Rapid Spin. Now, Rapid Spin is a pretty important move. You need to have Hazard Removal on your team. 
Stealth Rock and Spikes and Toxic Spikes are still widely distributed in this generation. So don't expect that because we have a list of moves that are not getting distributed well, that Stealth Rock will be among that. No, Stealth Rock is quite common and most teams, if not all teams, will have a Stealth Rocker or a Spiker of some sort. So you do need to have some hazard support. And Rapid Spin is a good option for that, especially because it gives you the plus one speed now. Now looking at this list, we see some perennial Rapid Spinners. Dawn Fan, along with its uh, Paradox forms, are on this list. So that's good to see. We can see Serena and Regieleki and Fortress, all of whom do quite well as Rapid Spinners. Oracle as well is quite good at Rapid Spinning, as well as bringing the Drought to the table. So that'll be good. And I can even see Cyclozar being a decent uh, rapid spinner, right? Because Cyclozar isn't the strongest Pokemon, but between its Shed Tail ability and the ability to rapid spin, I think it will have some decent utility, as well as being a pinch hitter for a team if it needs it. So I think that uh, there are a few good options. Toad's Cruel is another one I think could be a decent rapid spinner. But we do have to watch out because this is the entire list for all the tiers of who gets rapid spin. And so you better hope that your tier has a good rapid spinner. And I think most tiers will end up with one or two. But if you only end up with one or two, then that's your entire list. And now you have to make do with that for the entire tier. Uh, in a similar vein, we've got Defog. Defog is the alternative to rapid spin. It gets rid of screens, so in some ways it's better. But it also doesn't give you any other benefits besides that, really. Except for, you know, an evasion drop, which half the time comes back to bite you if your opponent has contrary. But Devog isn't bad. So let's look at the list here. You can see the Talonflame, Corviknight, Scizor, uh, Giratina, I guess. Get Defog. You know, some of these Pokemon, Noivern, Disajoy, sure. These Pokemon can run Defog pretty effectively. Uh, Halucha, though, Lurantis, they don't really want to be using Defog. If they can get away with it, they'd prefer to be doing their own thing. And then many other Pokemon like Drift, Blim, and Altar just aren't very good. So I don't really see them being effective defoggers outside of like Ranbats. And uh, Hisuian Lulligan is going to be sort of in a similar vein as maybe the more offensive Pokemon like Frostmoth and Halucha, where I just want to be setting up, right? I don't want to be saddled with defog duty as well. In previous generations, think of maybe Kartana, right? Kartana could run defog, but then it's not doing his job as an offensive attacker. So Hisuian Lilligan gets Defog. Super cool. Really neat. I like that. But why would I ever run that when I should be setting up Victory Dances or Sword Dances or whatever and then sweeping your team? That's what Hisuian Lilligan should be doing. Braviary gets Defog, and I think in a similar in a similar line of thinking, Braviary should probably be more offensive, less supportive, because it has the ability to be more offensive, right? It's got Tinted Lens on the Hisuian form. It's got Defiant on the physical form. Uh, you, you want to be attacking with Braviary, or at least setting up with Braviary and then attacking. And I don't think Defog is going to be seen a lot on it. So there, there are very few Defoggers. A uh, note like, for instance, Landris is not on this list with Defog. So Defog Landris is no longer a thing. So this is going to uh, change the value of these Pokemon. If you want a Defogger, if you want a Rapid Spinner, then you have to look at these Pokemon. And if previous moves that these Pokemon might have lost, but they still have these options, well, then that means that their value still is quite high because they're the only guys that can do these things. So keep an eye out on these Pokemon to be high value picks in any metagame that they end up in. Next up, we've got sort of a one off. We've got Weather Ball here. And Weather Ball isn't really a niche that needs to be on every kind of team. But it is something that's useful on weather teams. Fancy that. And in the past, we've seen things like Weather Ball Venusaur really put in a lot of work. And so any Pokemon that has Weather Ball has the ability to be a scary threat on a weather team if it can slot it in. Now, some Weather Ballers don't really ever have the ability to, take, to really take off. For instance, Ice Q is on this list. Ice Q isn't a special attacker, and it's not good on weather teams. So you never see Ice Q use Weather Ball. But other Pokemon like uh, Obama Snow can use it. Uh, it could have used it if it needed to, but it usually doesn't. 
uh, Glilly Frost lasts, similar vein, not really. I think Frost lasts sometimes, but not really. A uh, Bronzong, I feel like I've seen a Weather Ball Bronzong like twice in my life. Volcanion can run it, but usually does not. And then you've got all the new Pokemon that have it. And I don't really think most of these are going to be able to use it effectively. Robska and Ar Arboliva are too slow. And I don't think that they'd be good attackers in a weather team. The, the one exception and the one that I think that you should keep an eye on on this list for weather ball is Kilowattril. So one Pokemon that currently uses weather ball a lot in generation eight is Zapdos. And Zapdos uses that on a rain team, right? I've got Hurricane, I've got Thunder, I've got Weather Ball, and then I have some other move, Full Switch, U Turn, Bruce, something like that. Well, guess what? Zapdos does not get Weather Ball in this generation. But guess what does get Weather Ball? Kilowattril. So Kilowattril gets Thunder, Hurricane, and, uh, and Weather Ball. So I think that this actually makes for a decent substitute for Zapdos. They're, they're a little bit different. And Zapdos is stronger than Kilowattril, but Kilowattril is also faster than Zapdos. So you win some, you lose some. And I actually think that it's sort of a side grade to Zapdos in a way. It's a lot less bulky, so you definitely have to watch out for that. But uh, but yeah, Weather Ball. I think the only Pokemon you're going to see use it consistently will be Kilowattril. Next up is a big one, Knock Off. Knock Off is a very important move in the competitive scene. It gets rid of items. This can be from everything for heavy duty boots to leftovers to a choice band or a choice scarf. You always want to have at least one knockoff user on your team. And before there were very many knockoff users. Not only is knockoff good utility, but it's also a very good dark stab option. So Pokemon like Crawdont and Bisharp really want to have knockoff as their main dark attack because not only is a good utility, but if the opponent has an item, it becomes a very powerful, like 97 base power move or something like that. Because it's normally 65, and then it gets a 1.5 times boost. So it's actually a decently strong move. But let's see which Pokemon retain knockoff. Well, Muck gets knockoff, but it's only going to be a Lolan Muck. Normal Muck does not get knockoff, so only Lolan Muck will get it. Dawnfan gets it, Pelipper gets it, they both definitely run it. Gardevoir gets it, and Glade, Glade runs it, Gardevoir does not. Hariyama uh, definitely appreciates it. Hariyama is actually one of like the OG knockoff users that would use it even back before it got that move buff. Sableye, Binet, well, nobody ever uses Binet, but Sableye maybe. Somebody could use it. Samurai gets it. Uh, Zoroark, both forms actually of Zoroark get it, so that'll be a very useful thing for Zoroark to run. Hoopa will get it, and that one's sort of funny because Hoopa has Hyperspace Fury, so why would I be using Knock Off when I could use Hyperspace Fury? But if I'm the only one that can use Knock Off, maybe I should be using Knock Off and Hyperspace Fury. That's a, that's an interesting question, but it's on the list. Decidueye gets it, which is sort of cool. Salazzle sometimes runs Knock Off as more of a support move. Uh, maybe we'll see a rise in that, but on the other hand, Passimian often ends up in the same tier as Salazzle, something around NU tier, and it also still gets it. And I think Passimian will really appreciate that because Passimian can be a very good metagame staple and having knockoff will, I think, cement it as a strong staple this generation. Meowskarada gets it, and this Pokemon could either be high OU or it could get banned to Ubers, depending on how the tier goes. If it gets banned to Ubers, then we won't have that knockoff user anymore. But if it sticks around, then I think I guess we'll see a lot of knockoff coming out from Meowskarada. Cyclozar, again, gets knockoff, right? Cyclozar has knockoff, has rapid spin, has shed tail if it's allowed to stick around, if not U turn, right? Cyclozar could be an annoying low tier threat. Uh, Bombardier will get stab on knockoff, so that could be sort of an interesting pickup on Bombardier. Specifically, like, I don't think Bombardier's stats are really conducive to being a strong Pokemon, but it does get that, so it does have that going for it. Cloth gets it, but I don't really think Cloth is a great knockoff user, because it won't be Stab, and you really want to be setting up and using Rock moves with, with, uh, with Cloth. But, you know, it could be a good secondary move, maybe. 
Graphi Eye gets it, but it's a very frail weak Pokemon. I don't think it'll be a very good one. Great Tusk and Iron Treads. Once again, the Dawn Fan Paradoxes get it. Once again, cementing Dawn Fan is one of the best Pokemon of this generation, in my opinion. Iron Jugulus, which is the future form of Hydreigon, gets it. This is interesting because it will be Stab, but it also will be on a, on a stat that it's not good with, right? It's a special attack, not a physical attacker. So I don't think it'll be seeing knockoff on it, even though it could use it. Iron Valiant, this is the uh, Gladivar future form. And I, uh, I'm pretty happy to see that it gets that. That really boosts its value, I think. In case, you know, in case that Pokemon needed value. Then you got Wo Chien, which is going to be probably banned to Ubers. So I don't think that'll be sticking around the LU tier or below. Then you got Tinkaton, which I think that will be a good one to, to use knockoff on. And then Toadscrawl. Once again, Toadscrawl making this list. So knockoff is restricted to those Pokemon only. Now you could say that's a lot of Pokemon with knockoff, right? Even if they're like six tiers, that's still, you know, a good number per tier. However, you got to think. This also means that any Pokemon that's not on this list doesn't get knockoff. So a big one that didn't make the list, Bisharp. Bisharp is a huge knockoff user. It's not on this list, doesn't get knockoff. That includes its evolution. Other Pokemon that might have wanted it, like Primate, they don't get it. So they're going to have to use something like Throat Chop or uh, something else really lame like that. So do keep that in mind that the physical dark types in this generation are either going to have knockoff or they're going to be much lower value than they would have been in the past because they don't have knockoff. Knockoff is the strongest physical dark move that is commonly ran. And without it, you're going to be a lot weaker. And the value that knockoff brings is so big that if you can't bring that to the table, then you're going to be a lot lower value when it comes to building teams. All right. And number two, we've got Toxic. Toxic, of course, is one of those uh, moves that a lot of people love to hate because it enables stall or balance teams to whittle down the opponent and then beat them in the long run. And so many people would love to see Toxic go because it's a really annoying move. However, Toxic has been around since Generation 1 in some form or fashion, and I think that it has a rightful place in the Pokemon metagame. Having Toxic is a pretty important option when it comes to dealing with fat Pokemon as well. Being able to get fat Pokemon's HP low and getting them on a timer is really crucial. How many times have you tried to get rid of a Landorus, but it just won't die? But having it toxic means that it will be taking consistent, reliable chip, even if you were forced to switch this turn. So I think that toxic can enable fat, but it can also get rid of fat. And I think that it should be respected as such. Now, there are a lot of toxic users, but not as many as were in the past. Uh, prior to Generation 8, most Pokemon could learn toxic if they could learn a TM. Toxic was one of the most widely distributed TMs, and as a result, many Pokemon could learn Toxic and would use Toxic in the metagame depending on how the metagame was looking. For instance, Zapdos could sometimes run Toxic even though it has nothing to do with Toxic at all. It would still run it because it would be useful for it as uh, in, the, in that version or iteration of the metagame, right? Now, let's look at the Toxic users. And the one thing I want to point out on this list, how many Toxic users on here are not Poison types? We've got We've got Breloom, we've got Vespiquin, we've got uh, we've got Claude Sire, or not Claude Sire, Quagsire, sorry. Claude Sire is a poison type, Quagsire is not. And then we have Toadscrawl, which despite looking like a Tentacruel, is actually not a poison type, it's grass ground. So we have four Pokemon on this list with Toxic that are not poison type. Everybody else is a poison type. Now Toxic on a poison type is actually really good because it means you're not allowed to miss. Toxic from a, a, a poison type Pokemon will always hit the target, even if it's flying or digging. So that's not bad. I love having Toxic on a poison type, but a lot of times you don't want to use Toxic on such a Pokemon. You want to use Toxic on a Pokemon that isn't going to be weak to Psychic or weak to ground, for example. 
especially because a lot of bulk ground types are the ones who want to toxic and they're the ones that are going to scare the toxic user out. So having it on a non-poison Pokemon can be very important, but you only have four Pokemon in this entire metagame that learn toxic that aren't explicitly poison type. Also, a lot of these Pokemon are going to fit into a similar vein as we saw earlier with Defog, where, uh, or Wish, where I want to be attacking my opponent. I don't want to be statusing my opponent because of how they are. For example, Claude Sire is a very defensive Pokemon, so it can use Toxic, that's no problem. Pokemon like Salazzle or Glamora are specifically tailored to Toxic you because they have Corrosion. And so they're going to be running more specialized support sets. That's fine. But when it comes to Pokemon that are like Toxicroak, Pokemon like Dragalge, uh, Pokemon like Gengar, they are offensive. They don't want to be wasting time going for Toxic. Pokemon like Toadscruel even, one of the four Pokemon that is not a poison type explicitly, is an odd toxic user because it does have that mycelium might ability which means that if it goes for toxic it will be at the end of the turn or it's either that it's the end of its bracket or that it gets a minus one priority i'm not sure which it is just based off of the description alone but whichever one it is uh, it means it's going to be slower than you so it can get taunted very easily if it's relying too much on its status moves and i think you'd rather be using spore if you're going to go for a status on Toad's Cruel. So I don't really see that using Toxic. Breloom, as another Toxic user that's not Poison type, a lot of times doesn't want to run a uh, defensive set. It can, and it is a very decent defensive option, but it often wants to run a more offensive set. And depending on how the metagame is trending, it may not even have the option of running a, a, a defensive set. For example, in BDSP, we saw a lot of defensive Toxic or Poison Heal Breilooms with uh, Substitute and other stall options. But if in this generation, it's a lot harder to deal with the overwhelming offensive presence, then Breiloom won't be able to out-recover and outstall the very offensive Pokemon. So it will be forced to run an offensive set itself. And Breiloom can run offensive sets, right? You've got Mach Punch, Rock Tomb, uh, Bullet Seed, things like that. So Breiloom is a decent offensive Pokemon, so it will want to trend that way, which means it's not going to be running Toxic. There's another Pokemon off the list that could run it. Pokemon like Muck, uh, Alolan Muck usually wants to run an Assault Vest, is not going to be running Toxic if it has an Assault Vest. Normal Muck wants to be running things like Choice Band, and isn't very good uh, compared to Alolan Muck, so I don't think you'll see a lot of it. And so you, you're going to be whittling your list of, of viable Toxic users down significantly. I think they'll be seeing a lot more toxic spikes users and a lot fewer toxic users in this generation. You do still have Toxapex and Eternatus, but especially with Toxapex, it remains to be seen how effective they will be in keeping up with the metagame with the immense power creep that we've got this generation. Finally, up uh, on our list at number one, we've got Sticky Web. Sticky Web is a somewhat niche strategy especially since Generation 8 with the introduction of Heavy Duty Boots, meaning that Rapid Spinners often carry the boots specifically so that they can come in on, ra uh, on Sticky Web, not worry about it, get the Rapid Spin off, and then completely defeat the strategy. But Sticky Web was at least pa uh, decently distributed. Ever since it was introduced in Generation 6, it has had a limited distribution among bug types and certain other fairies and things like that but it was building up to a decent catalog at a certain point. However, we are now back down to only three Pokemon having Sticky Web. We've got Spidops, Masquerain, and Krikatoon. That's it. And Masquerain is not known for being a very good Pokemon, but out of the three options here, I would say Masquerain is the best. You've got Intimidate, you've got a decent speed tier, and that's about all you've got. Krikatoon is a trash Pokemon. You can't make Krikatoon work with Sticky Web, and Spidops is somehow even worse, I think. Maybe Spidops is slightly better, I, I don't know, but they're both very bad. Quite slow, terrible defenses. So I would argue that in this generation, it's Masquerade or Bust, 
and really it's mostly bust because Sticky Web is not going to be doing anything in this generation. At least not until we get DLC and we can bring back some of the more usual suspects like Rabombi or or even a Flurpuff or something like that, right? And until we can get some of those Pokemon back, I don't see Sticky Web really being a thing. But, you know, maybe you guys can make it work. Anyway, uh, that's the list of 10 moves that are going to be heavily restricted in Pokemon this generation and how having those restricted moves increases the value of the Pokemon on this list. Anyway, uh, let me know if I missed anything and let me know how you feel about this in the comments below and I'll catch you guys next time.